much. Um, that was all incredibly interesting, and uh, you guys uh, really do belong up here. <laughs> it's, it's a little frightening. Um, I, I have one, one sort of general question, and then if we have time, maybe we can get to some specific ones. But uh, looking back 10 years, and looking ahead 10 years in cities like London, New York, San Francisco, uh, other, other cities, it, it keeps happening. We see that you know, people who are working in bars are working essentially uh, service jobs, uh, maybe not major high wage earners. The customers at some of the, especially in 50 top bars, tend to get uh, richer and richer. And as the cities evolve, uh, we're getting more and more development, we're getting more, uh, the economies are changing to the point where the bartenders can't afford necessarily to live in the same city as uh, their bar is, or the same part of the city. And this sort of, this divide, I mean, this is, we're gonna have to deal with this, I think, for the next 10 years for sure. Where, where do you guys see uh, some of these issues? You know, I could easily start with this one. Uh, as one of the Americans on the panel, um, we wake up every, every day in America to Donald Trump as our president, uh, and, it, and it's, a, it's hard. So, I mean, I think one of the things that I've found personally is that if you were to boil down what we do on a daily basis in our venues, the hospitality business, mm -hmm. the bartending business, is the problem-solving business. And, and the problems that we're solving are often sometimes simple. Someone spilled a drink, someone needs a coat, you know, I have seven drinks to make, oh my gosh, what do I make first? But I feel like the, the people on the front lines, the people who are working in our bars are excellent problem solvers. And, and I think as we sort of think about the challenges we face in the future, I think we can look to these people for leadership, for examples, for mm -hmm. stories, for positive stories. And, and I also find that one of the reasons that, that kind of drew me to bars as a young person was that, is that bars are one of the, the world's great melting pots where you have people of all different stations in society from different, you know, of all different types of people being together and interacting with each other. And in that sense, I find bars to be a really interesting and important petri dish to begin to look at for how we solve some of society's bigger problems and challenges. Well, I certainly, I don't think any, any of us would argue about that, especially the, uh, the, um, uh, the resourcefulness of bartenders. But I do, I do wonder about uh, customers uh, when cocktail prices, because of rents, uh, start edging up 18, 20 dollars, 20 pounds in, in London. Uh, you know, how do the, how do the Londoners deal with that? I think there's <clears throat> previously, like historically, all of the, the kind of leading restaurants or bars were, were in West London. And I think a reaction to that was a lot of people who, who wanted to strike out and they saw mm -hmm. that there was a need to bring those, those products that people were bringing from a point of passion to different parts of the city. And you're seeing now, I mean, East London was that first boom and things changed dramatically in the landscape of the city after that. Um, but you're seeing a lot of neighborhood bars that are really elevating their game. And this isn't a price point mm -hmm. thing. It's about just bringing that sense of like, customer-centric service. You know, we've always had pubs which are I mean, the, the, the church for the non-religious in, in, in the UK. And it's, it's, it's kind of that meeting place for everybody. But people are trying to then develop kind of cocktail bars that are situated in really residential areas. Um, and they're trying to bring, bring those things, and there's some really amazing examples in London at the moment. Now, is this something we might see from you in the future? Yeah, we're going to turn, after we transition Dan Line into Lioness, we'll do Dan Line as a roving dive bar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know uh, at, at Death and Company, you have a downstairs with pints and, and, and yeah. shots and, you know, things that are sort of neighborhood, neighborhood friendly. I mean, is, is that something that... Uh, like, like we're going to see more of, do you think? There's like two-tier bars or bars with, with... It definitely helps, I will say. I mean, I think anybody that operates or owns a bar would, would agree, especially in New York City, like the, the cost of labor is, is getting crazy. And so with that, you know, because it's costing us more money to operate, then we have to um, raise our prices. It's just, 
It's how, yeah. how it works. Um, so no, you don't want to have $18 cocktails, but you have to because, you know, you think about the ice, the glassware, the, the prep guy that made the juice and the garnishes, everything that we have to, you know, account for everything. And um, it is going to get to the point where, wow, with, a, with, a, with tax and then with the tip, it's going to be $24 for a cocktail. And people are going to, you know, having more options, like I think it does help in our business model to have the downstairs. It, it is why the parlor exists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and having those standalone alone cocktail bars is kind of scary. Not having the options to have, you know, a, a, a beer on draft. And, but then right. do you want those people coming in and just ordering beers and, and getting a bit of food? Like, yeah, they're that not, they're not paying your rent. <laughs> but I think with, it's with, like with getting people in and like and creating that experience where they continue to come back and being, being, being a voice out there to have people come in. Like we're a huge destination bar. Um, internationally, the people are in with their suitcases, you know, to come. And you have people that are regulars that live in the neighborhood mm -hmm. or after work. So I think it's, it is about location, it's about your voice, and it's about like giving people that experience where they keep wanting to come back and they're, they're willing to pay that extra dollar. So uh, that's sort of value, value, value for your money. Yeah. I mean, and we're not going to drop the ball on our right. quality ever, right. even, and it, especially right. when you raise the prices. Like we've um, in the in the tap room, we've elevated the cocktails, and we've met, gotten better ice and better glassware and better training for our staff, and that's something that we can feel okay about charging seventeen dollars for a cocktail. Is anyone in, anyone in from Attaboy? Anyone here from Attaboy? Doubt, doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe the prices of drinks in this town. I paid four hundred and fifty dollars for a glass of whiskey at Attaboy last night. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mickey just pulled a fast one. <laughs> They just did it I to you. I checked my bank out this morning and thought, Jesus Christ, they put the rent up at Milk you know, Street. Anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> amazing talk. It's just... Now, you, you, but you, you kind of operate bars that, that do reach out uh, beyond the, the sort of the luxury customer. And uh, is that uh, working for you? Is that? Yeah, definitely. I think, is this working? I'm not sure it is. Can anyone hear me? Yeah? yeah. Um, I think I got tired of, well, you know, I've been in hospitality a long time, right. and I owned a hotel for a while, and it, it was stressful enough having a bar that was open seven days a week, and somebody comes in for an hour or two for a couple of drinks, and maybe a bite to eat, and then they go home, and you look after them for that two or three hours. It's a really important time for them, so it's a really important time for us. When they stay in your hotel, and they sleep in the same building, and you know, you rid them for even longer time. It becomes really stressful. And I think if you're going down the luxury high service model, mm -hmm. it's you know, every detail needs to be right and you become obsessed by it. And it just becomes, it, for me, it was too stressful. And so I just wanted to simplify everything just for an easier life, a happier life. You know, I'm not, we're not trying to be clever at German sex dungeon. It's cans, <laughs> it's craft cans and shots. Mm -hmm. You know, and but, so you, your expectations are you want a cold beer and you want, you know, and this is choice of whiskey and tequila. And how do you handle issues of uh, quality for the cocktails at the at the cocktail bar? Well, we've got some great cocktail bartenders who've you know worked with me at mm -hmm. you know the bars in the past, and so we've got bars like Zephyr and Pavilion and uh, Contra, and where we did tequila versus rum, so you could try a, you know margarita next to a daiquiri, and it, so we we do all that as well. But it's not our main thing. Well, uh, one one of the ways. Uh, Bartenders move ahead is by winning competitions and by getting uh, drinks that get noticed by the press and getting those on menus. And uh, it, it is by this often over-the-top innovation. So how do you keep the, your bartenders motivated without that access to that career path? They can still do all that. They can still do yeah, that. Yeah. You, and they can do that in your bars. Absolutely, or, yeah. Uh, you, Absolutely, yeah. They can come up with little glasses that look like pipes garnished with. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to go in there and that say, go mate, well, I yeah. got to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. well, they, they, they've got more control and ownership of the bar than I have. Okay. Definitely. And uh, how do you like handle these, uh, these issues of control with the bartenders when you've got a bar in Hong Kong and one in New York? but you're living in Portland. I th one of the things I was saying to Jeff when I read a different version of my speech earlier is that a lot of people who know me have heard the story, but maybe some of you guys haven't, but the best thing I ever did for PDT was I went home. 
and once I saw how well it ran without me there, I, I really kind of never came back. <laughs> um, I'll never forget when I opened, I, I sort of described the opening team at PDT as a little bit like Australia, and I forgive me for all you Australians. It was all the people who couldn't get full-time work at the seven other cocktail bars mm -hmm. who kind of joined me. And I was a little leery of this. And for the first few months, I was worried that maybe, that, you know, I wasn't sure how well they'd make my drinks. I wasn't sure how well they'd run the bar. And people who, I don't really have any friends. I have what I call frenemies. And my frenemies occasionally called me. And they said, Jim, I was at your bar last night. And I thought, wow, thanks for calling me. But I can't believe you actually showed up. And I was ready for them to lay it on thick. And they said, you know what? I had the greatest time last night. And I like literally was thinking to myself like, Naren, is this you? You, you, had a, <laughs> you had a great time? You know, Angus Winchester, you, you went to my bar and you had a good time? And I just thought like, people who had never said anything nice to me in my whole life, <laughs> Jacob Breyers, you know, people, people would be like, I had the greatest time last night. And I, and I began to realize that like, the biggest problem with my bar wasn't my team, my drinks, my room. It was the ferociously unfair, critical way in which I thought it should be operated. And I think once I like let these people mm. operate, like, like you went to the bar last night and an AK served you, you're a pretty rigorous person, you had a great time. And, and I feel like things go better at PDT when I'm in Portland. Well, for, for, for the record, <laughs> I'm your friend. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, so how do you like, where do you step in and say, uh, this has to change. I mean, if you're, if you're leaving these, these places to sort of run themselves, where do you, what's, what's the line that brings Jim Meehan in to, uh, to, 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 oh, to impose your personality on the place? I feel like when I lived here and I, it was, that was something that I could do because mm -hmm. I was here. I feel like, but when you're not here, when, you, when you're not able to follow each critical comment with something positive, or when you're almost never around, you sort of lose the opportunity to be critical because you're not there enough to right. reinforce the positive behavior. So honestly, I'm in, when something needs to happen, it's not, no one's gonna hear about it through me, they're gonna hear about it through Jeff or AK, or I'm gonna get all sort of like Sparrow from, from Game of Thrones and maybe like, plant a seed with Santi or plant a mm -hmm. seed with someone else and see where it goes. But I feel like for the most part, when you decide not to be there every night, you cede the ability to, to lead in that manner. And you have to trust the people who, who have taken that. So it comes back to hiring, in other it words? It comes back and, to hiring. Like, what I, and what I always say is you can, I can train you how to do the job the way that I want it to be done, but I can't train you to care. And I find that by bringing people in who care deeply and who have integrity um, and letting them work, mm -hmm. we've, we've been very successful. Now, let's, let's talk a little more about education because uh, obviously once you have an, educa uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, an agenda and a fairly uh, comp comprehensive one, who do you get to do the training? Who trains, who trains the, uh, the head bartenders? You know, where do you, where do you, find, where do you find the training? Do we, do we have that in the industry? Well, I think uh, there's several different uh, aspects to it, uh, probably. I, in, in our company, I do a lot of the training still myself, which obviously indicates it's a super small company. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what, uh, what Gillian uh, touched upon was mm -hmm. uh, this thing of creating a culture and uh, setting the, the ways how we go around things. So for me, uh, it's much more important to be, to, to be having, you know, a sort of kind of constitution or, or a way of thinking uh, and, you know, creating this little tribe that, you know, we all think this way. And, and if you don't like to think this way, you really cannot be with us. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of trainings which uh, can be outsourced and are probably better outsourced. Just to yeah, pick up on that point, you know, when, when I was a young bartender, the, the resources for learning were, were pretty limited. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of, there was a handful of books out there, there was a couple of websites, and we were really fortunate, you know, particularly in my time in Scotland, to have amazing mentors who would guide through things. And when we were starting to, to kind of apply for, for our venues, and now being very conscious of this as we're, we're going outside of London, um, was kind of what everybody's 
like touched on a bit was was actually more the, the thinking behind it. Like there are certain bits that we have, of course love to instill, and that connection to the to the business is something I never want to sever. But it's it's also about kind of giving them the inspiration to find out things from their own path. I think learning is very different for different people, and I think once we try and instill the the idea behind we do why we do things a particular way, and you know we give that empowerment. Nothing is apart from double straining a drink, sorry Americans, everything is, <laughs> is sacred, like nothing is sacred in the venue. Like we can challenge anything and so if we're kind of saying, right, you can, you can explore anything you want to do, well this is why we do things a certain way, they, they research their own things and the, the opportunities for education now are so wide and that's not just from stuff from our industry, it's from other industries. Um, and I think if you kind of guide them on that kind of like give the kind of creative kick to them, they, they're, they're more willing to kind of go and find out stuff in their own way as well. That's not as passing the buck on the, the no, education. No, no, no. It's, uh, I think that's important because yeah. you, you have to, you ha obviously you have to uh, learn yourself. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we run into a problem with our, with our good and beloved friend, the internet, where there's as much, <laughs> as much, I'm being really, really kind here, <laughs> uh, bad information as there is good. Sure. So how do you, you know, get people to learn, to teach people how to weigh the information? And, well, I, I think again, it's the why. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if the things that they're seeking out, there is, um, you know, they can draw in different stories and it's actually not about trying to get them to find answers, mm -hmm. it's trying to get them to find ways of asking questions in a different way. So we're not trying to go this, we're not, you know, it's, it's never Iron Fist, it's not me, Ian or Alex saying mm -hmm. it's got to be this way, so as long as they're trying to find out different ways of doing things, then as a group we can then challenge and assess that. Can I jump in with a, with a related question? This is come through on social media, the power internet. of social media. Oh my God, questions. from the internet. Yeah. <laughs> from the internet. This is actually directed at Alex, it's appropriate enough about social media. Does social media have a positive or negative effect on the hospitality industry? Well, I'm getting a big question here. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I think there's a lot of positive. There's a lot of positive, can you hear me? Yeah. There's, there's definitely a lot of positive stuff, uh, but I feel uh, that uh, in the last sort of five years there's been also a lot of negativity. Uh, it probably comes, it's connected to the education, it's all very young, very new, people don't know how to react. People sometimes uh, don't consider how their actions might affect themselves or somebody else. So it's a really difficult ground and uh, I, I think we should uh, all focus more on the positive stuff uh, because lately I feel uh, it's just going very negative and uh, you know, there shouldn't be a reason why we like to see other people uh, fail. Should you we know? take this opportunity to see if there are any questions from the audience? Don't be shy and do wave and we'll try and get a microphone to you. If anyone has any questions for our esteemed panel, I'm having trouble seeing, but if you do... Wave. One over there. Do we have okay. A microphone? Back further. Okay. Hi. Um, I guess going off of William's question, talking about social media, how do you think, it, for anyone on the panel, how do you think it personally kind of positively and or negatively affects your business and how do you pivot depending on how it does affect you guys personally? Declan, you have an answer, so your turn. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, like, I think social media is obviously, it's only as good as its users. Um, I think the, the reality is it's transformed the industry. Um, there is a, a great opportunity these days um, for bartender-owned operations, and I think that social media is one of the key parts to that. Uh, I personally can only see um, uh, the positive impact that it has on the industry. The negativity, it's your choice just to cut it out. Um, and I think that um, used in the right way, you can quite simply transform your, your business. Um, there is obviously, though, the all-important thing, uh, and nothing beats inspiring a guest to talk about you. Uh, nothing beats reading and listening to the guest. Social media can provide that, but ultimately uh, we will always have the, the, the roots laid in success through generating guests coming back to the bar. Uh, and what social media can do really is um, embellish upon that, expand upon that, and it can show you all the cool things you do. Uh, it can show you some of the interesting things you do, uh, and it can allow you to express yourself 
uh, and show off a name like German Sex Dungeon, which might not necessarily um, <laughs> spread north of the river, let alone across the Atlantic. <laughs> I think there was another question <clears throat> from that way. Wave again, if you've got a, your, you had your hand up. I can't see. I'm going to add in another question for, for Declan that came through on social as well, <clears throat> which is specific to you. How do you, Great. How do you go from being a, a head bartender to being a great bar manager? What are the skills you need? Uh, I think um, being a manager, um, I think the key is obviously um, you, you, need to, the need, you need to have an element of selflessness because when you become a manager in theory, um, you gain all power, but the reality is you lose all your power. Um, as I say, everything comes to uh, inspiring our guests and as a manager, you can't do any of that because your team do that. I think the, the, the key as a, as a leader um, is you have to genuinely care um, about the people. You have to provide the inspiration for your team. They have to be motivated to go and deliver it. They have to enjoy working with you. They have to have fun with you. Um, and they, they have to go and do your thoughts, but not just your thoughts, you have to allow a team to go and do their own thing, express themselves, something historically I've not always been great at because I can be a bit of a micromanager, uh, I'm sure Eric will agree on that, uh, but uh, it, you have to sort of release people to, to do it, but ultimately uh, the key to making that change to being a leader is uh, to have that passion for people uh, and uh, your results uh, are literally the most important thing is how successful your team become, the stories that they walk away with and the inspiration that their job gives them um, and that's, uh, that's how you kind of build your leadership. Does that answer the question? Perfectly. <laughs> uh, Dave, do you have any final questions? For well, I, I have one more question for you about storytelling. Uh, We're on a roll, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the hell? What the hell? Uh, you got to talk in six. It just has to be the nearies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, where would have been the, the fun in that? No. We were having such a good time there. <laughs> um, so we're living in kind of a, a crazy time for uh, the field of history, which is changing rapidly. We're finding out things that we never knew. And uh, how does that affect your storytelling? You know, there's, uh, do you have an obligation to uh, keep stories current? Or do you, uh, do you have an obligation to, like, let's say, historical truth? in the storytelling or is the obligation to entertain the customer uh, regardless and sort of edit things in, in the most entertaining way? I think um, I remember years ago Eric talking um, to team members about not wearing a watch behind a bar because as a guest gets to the bar they might not want to be reminded what the time is and they might not want to uh, uh, be reminded where they should be. You know, I'm a father of two kids, so quite often, you know, I definitely don't want to be reminded where I should be. Um, and uh, I think that uh, escapism um, is is one of those um, passions that everyone has. Uh, you can maybe play on what's going on uh, if it's used in the right way, uh, but I think ultimately um, people will want to lose their inhibitions at such and. Uh, people want to go on a bit of a journey mm -hmm. uh, and they might not want to uh, come into a bar and talk about the current president and things like that. Well, um, and uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that uh, having that escapism is a, is a good thought process. Um, we could also say that maybe there are ways to bring new escapes for people, I suppose, with with new stories. I mean, I'm, I'm just asking because the Savoy has got such a long and storied history and uh, we only hear little parts of it, you know, and, and it, it would, there must be some amazing stories buried among the, the people who weren't the famous bartenders and uh, stories that uh, would, would be wonderful to, to, to hear from the Savoy. Yeah, like, um, but I think the Savoy is a, is a good example. Um, the Savoy wouldn't be famous if we just recycled stories and recycled cocktails. Uh, if you look at Harry Craddock, he, he arrived and, uh, in the mid-1920s, uh, and he literally ripped up the, everything that was going on in the bar and did his own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that classic innovation uh, is, is the fundamental of what keeps that hotel alive, because if you, uh, if you simply recycle and regurgitate, uh, that's potentially going to get a bit boring as well. Uh, 
It is, isn't it? <laughs> well, you guys thankfully don't do that, so. What's the next question? <laughs> <laughs> one more, time for one more question, unless anyone wants to Anybody, the uh, audience. If you do, now's your chance, otherwise. One more question. Let's go for the drink. Yeah, well, yeah, we're, we're, what's, what's to drink? <laughs> what's, we've got about 14 um, bars downstairs, to, yeah, yeah. which we're all awaiting, so we won't keep you much longer. Uh, Dave, do you have a final question for Ryan or Jonathan? Um, well, let me, let me ask uh, uh, Jonathan, um, have you ever considered bringing the street feasts over here? Oh, yeah, definitely. And... Uh, yeah. What are the what, what are the obstacles and the? Uh, uh, we're not ready yet. We're not ready for America. Um, <laughs> you're not ready for the Americans, or you're not ready for America. <laughs> no, uh, we uh, we need to. I need to open some more sites in London first, and one in Manchester, mm -hmm. and then I think three more Dinorama sites, sites, and then I'd, I'd love to do some in LA or maybe in Brooklyn or uh, Miami, places like that. I've had a good look round. Found some great sites and some good deals. Mm -hmm. There's a real appetite for it. I think the Calb in downtown Brooklyn is a great, you know, modern um, sort of food hall. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, My I daughter works there, so. Yeah, I think, I think it's the best. I've been to pretty much every one in, mm -hmm. in, in North America, and I think the Calb's my favorite, definitely. You know? Now, uh, here's a question for everybody, and it, it's kind of uh, comes up from what Jillian was saying, and a little bit about what, what, what you were saying, Jonathan. Uh, about uh, you know educating and, and, and getting an inclusive atmosphere in your bar, and, and we heard a lot about the staff. What about customers? Mm. How do you curate the customers so that you get uh, good customers who uh, get a good ap atmosphere in your bar, so so you don't have problems from them? Call it German sex dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you get all the problem people in one place. <laughs> Well, we, in, when it, it doesn't really apply now. I sort of touched on it in my speech, but when we started out, we curated our customers by what we didn't sell. Mm -hmm. So we didn't sell pints. We didn't sell energy drinks. We didn't show sports on TV because too many blokes would come in and that, you know, they'd, be, they'd be difficult customers at that time in London. It's not like that now. We've got a new generation of people who are way better behaved you know, and just much nicer people to take care of. So I, I don't know what you do these mm -hmm. days. I suppose you could do it with music. You could do it with pricing. You can do it with location. I think it's also about being clear about what that venue does. You know, I think when it's got a clear identity, you attract the people that are attracted to whatever that place stands for. And I think with, um, you know, it, with all of the venues that we've been discussing and all the venues here, it's they've, the, the success comes, you can, you can describe to somebody what those venues are. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these places, and I think the best venues in the world, you kind of know what you're getting into. And of course, there's a bit of the unexpected, and that's the kind of exciting part. You don't know exactly what you're going to get, but you do know what it stands for. And, you know, you, like, to me, the, the nice thing particular about London and New York is there's such diverse experiences you can have. You know, you can go out with close friends and you want something very familiar and easy, and there's times you want to, you know, you're going on a date and you want to have something that feels a bit more special. And so being able to kind of know what you're directing, that occasion, mm -hmm. that, that style of drink, whatever you're trying to get out from the venue is, if it's clear, you can kind of curate the people that are going to be coming through it. Not that it doesn't want to still be open, but it can still be a bit more Alex, as someone that's a, about to open a new bar, do you have a clear vision of who that audience is and who your customers are and how you want to curate that? I actually have no idea because we're going into a neighborhood which is, uh, we're going to the neighborhood which uh, is uh, developing a lot. There's a lot of uh, new companies uh, and people moving in there. So uh, yes, we definitely uh, curating by the design, by the, the way how we structure menus and by the pricing point. Uh, but I think that we will need a few months actually to get a feel because the most important thing for us to do is to be serving the community which is in that place. And Jillian, you had a... Um, no, I mean, I think when, when you walk into a bar, um, it should be very clear what you're getting into. So, um, you know, we've definitely had some expansions and, and we were a little nervous that maybe people wouldn't feel as like as a that it was a pub atmosphere as mm -hmm. the as the, the original space um, but seeing the bar taps and like seeing the pints of guinness going out and the you know an irish coffee area um, but then seeing the bottles on the bar like oh i can get a cocktail here you know like that's how we set the tone and also having 
being the staff being clear on like what you're getting into. Um, okay, down here you just want like beers and shots and have be a little bit more loud and, and mm -hmm. rowdy. Great, a pub's for you. And if you want the cocktail experience upstairs, but it's how you communicate that, and that's through through your staff itself, your the initial like greeting of your doorman or your host or whatever. Um, but also on social media, we utilize that a lot to to kind of share our voice and um, the, the tone that we have and like what we expect. Uh, yeah. so. I had no yeah. idea what I was getting into last night with that $450 glass of whiskey. <laughs> 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 on that poignant note, on. we were we'll wrap things up, we're out of time. So uh, I'm Isn't sure everyone wants to go and have a drink in a moment, but let me take this opportunity to thank all of our sponsor partners for their support for today's event and uh, for the World's 50 Boats Bars overall. And in particular, thanks to Jim, to Declan, to Dave, Alex, Ryan, Jonathan and Gillian. A round of applause for our panel. Thank you. Thank you.